Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Scott Giacomucci. I'm the director and founder of the Phoenix Center for Experiential Trauma Therapy in Media, Pennsylvania. I'm board certified in sociometry, psychodrama, and group psychotherapy, and an expert in traumatic stress. I'm really excited that you found this video, and I hope that you find it helpful in your work. So this video is part of an ongoing video series to promote my newly published book, Social Work, Sociometry, and Psychodrama, Experiential Approaches for Group Therapists, Community Leaders, and Social Workers. And this video is going to be devoted to Chapter 4 in the book, which is titled, Social Work Philosophy Encounters Moranian Philosophy. So the first half of this video, we're going to explore Moranian philosophy, and in the second half of the video, we'll be looking at social work core values as they relate to Moreno's philosophy and the practice of sociometry and psychodrama. So in my experience, Moranian philosophy is one of the most misunderstood aspects of psychodrama, and it's one of the least taught aspects of psychodrama. Moreno, at the end of his life, was deeply disappointed and disturbed that his underlying philosophy from which sociometry, psychodrama, and his group therapy approaches emerged had been largely uh, forgotten, whereas his methods uh, had become popular. He really believed that psychodrama and sociometry needed to be informed by the philosophy from which they emerged and that uh, we need to, to integrate his philosophy and, and teach his philosophy to the next generation. In one of his publications, uh, he writes, this is from 1943, I have had the good fortune to develop three ideas. The first idea, a study of the Godhead, has remained cryptic and misapprehended. The second, a study of man called psychodrama has aroused some hope that man can train his spontaneity to overcome many of his shortcomings. My third idea, the study of society, called sociometry, has given the greatest promise that a measure can be developed for deeper understanding of society and a key to the treatment of its ills. Many of my friends consider these three ideas one apart from the other. In my own mind, however, all of these three ideas are of one piece. One is developed out of the other. The first idea initiates a canon of the universe, the second a canon of the individual, and the third a canon of human society. And again, this is a quote from uh, one of Moreno's publications in, the, in 1943. And you can see from this quote that he believed his sociometric system and his philosophy of the Godhead, his mysticism, was at least as important as psychodrama. Though nowadays psychodrama is much more popular than his sociometric system or his underlying philosophy. So in this video, we're really going to focus on that underlying philosophy. So one of the core ideas about Moreno's philosophy is the idea of the Godhead, which he mentions in that quote. So Moreno, in his uh, early years as a young adult and as a medical student in Vienna, he had studied the different world religions. Uh, he was raised with a lot of influence from Judaism, from his mother. And living in Vienna, he was influenced by Christianity. Uh, he also was deeply influenced by the Greek philosophers, particularly Aristotle and Socrates. And he had studied some of the other world religions. He was captivated by mysticism and spirituality, by uh, tea leaf readings and uh, tarot cards, archetypes. Um, and he had this idea that creativity was one of the common elements of deities across culture. And that if human beings also have this capacity to create creativity, that perhaps human beings are also divine, that human beings are also godlike. And so Moreno believed that there was a, a godhead of sorts, which was a source of all life and all spontaneity, 
and that within each person there also was the emergence of the Godhead, that each person was godlike, that each person was co-responsible for society, that each person had the ability to initiate change within their life, to uh, to be the the director and protagonist within their own life story. And so, uh, perhaps this is also one of the reasons why Moreno's philosophy has been less accepted, because it has a, a pretty radical spiritual and mystical assumption that all human beings are God and God-like. Uh, <clears throat> Moreno went as far as attempting to treat all human beings as if they were God. Uh, he would refer to his patients as doctors, and really try to dismantle some of the power dynamics that were inherent in psychiatry. Uh, he believed that everybody in the group had therapeutic agency and therapeutic power. And again, this really challenged some of the, the status quo and some of the other prevailing philosophies for psychiatry at the time. Uh, so Moreno's approach to human nature is that human beings are not just biological, psychological, emotional, economical, social creatures, but that first of all, human beings are cosmic beings. And so this is one of the areas where psychodrama is a bit different than other psychotherapies, in that it really emerged from Moreno's mysticism. It's one of the few therapies that comes from a religion, uh, one of the first things that Moreno created was a religion. It was called the Religion of the Encounter, and he founded what was called the House of the Encounter, where he welcomed immigrants and refugees from around the world and, and helped connect them with social support, with legal support and medical support, and most importantly, helped connect them with each other. So uh, Moreno was uh, in some ways even obsessed with this idea of the Godhead, with this uh, idea that all human beings were divine. And this, this philosophy really fueled everything that he did and influenced all of his later ideas. Uh, Moreno believed that within every person was a, what was called an autonomous healing center. He believed that there was a, a core aspect with, within a human being that was self-healing and autonomous, self-driven. And he, uh, really, Zerka writes mostly about the Autonomous Healing Center in reference to Moreno's beliefs. She says that the purpose of psychodrama, the purpose of all forms of therapy, is to help the protagonist clear away some of the barriers to accessing their autonomous healing center. Zorka goes as far as saying that she stopped thinking of herself as a psychotherapist, saying that she doesn't heal any psyches, that it's really the protagonists themselves that are doing the work, who are healing themselves. And Zorka says that she prefers to think of herself as a guide in the wilderness, helping the protagonists to find their own way. So this concept of the autonomous healing center is an important one in psychodrama. Just like the client and the patient has an autonomous healing center, so too does the professional. And that in order to be of most help to our clients as psychodramatists and, and as helping professionals, that we first need to tap into our own autonomous healing center. Uh, in terms of doing our own work, in terms of, a, you know, a longer timeline of addressing our own core traumas and emotional issues, but also in the moment of the session. That perhaps just before we begin a session or start a group, that we take the time to ground ourselves and to access our own autonomous healing center within, as therapists, as professionals. And this practice, this process is going to look different from person to person. Uh, a simple way of doing it is engaging in a, a little role reversal. Uh, one of the things my trainer taught me to do, uh, Ed Schreiber, 
was to, before I started facilitating a psychodrama group, to pull out an empty chair in my office and to do a short psychodrama vignette with myself. Take two, three, five minutes to speak to myself in the future or to talk to a part of myself that I was warmed up to or, or that related to the group at hand or my own counter-transference related to the group, my hopes or goals for the group or the topic for that group, and that by engaging in surplus reality and a role reversal, I was effectively tapping into my own autonomous healing center before going into the group to try to help clients to do the same. And so this is a, a helpful practice that I offer to you as well. Now, just like the therapist has an autonomous healing center, and every individual in the group has an autonomous healing center, we might also consider that the group as a whole has within it, as its own entity, an autonomous healing center. And that part of our task as group therapists, as facilitators, is to help the group as a whole tap into their capacity to heal themselves. In social work with groups, we call this mutual aid. The capacity for each group member to contribute to the healing, the education, the support, uh, the process for every other group member. In Yalom's therapeutic factors of group psychotherapy, he uses the term altruism to describe the same phenomenon, that the group has the power within it to heal itself. And this is one of the unique aspects of both psychodrama practice, psychodrama philosophy, and of social work with groups philosophy that the primary function of the facilitator is to help the group heal itself. So to help the group tap into its own autonomous healing center. And taking that idea a bit further, if every group has its own autonomous healing center, then perhaps also every community has its own autonomous healing center. Every organization has an autonomous healing center within and even society as a whole, perhaps, has an autonomous healing center. And when we're working to create healing on a larger scale, in, in the case of macro social work or society in the Moranian uh, tradition, that our goal might be to help a community, an organization, or all of society tap into its own autonomous healing center, trusting that that entity, that group, community, society, knows what it needs to heal and has the power to heal itself if only we can help guide them in removing some of the barriers to healing. And so this is a core aspect of Moranian philosophy. Now, another related idea is the, the encounter symbol, which is also core to Moranian philosophy. The encounter symbol, it, it looks like the Under Armour, the clothing symbol, it's uh, two halves of a circle that intersect with each other. If we were to just pull them apart a bit, we would have a full circle. And so this encounter symbol, uh, is, it's a symbol that represents or symbolizes another aspect of Moranian mysticism. The encounter symbol is a, a depiction of what Moreno called the first and the second universe. Moreno describes the first universe as the universe where all things are sacred, a universe of formlessness and timelessness, the universe where the Godhead lives, the, the place where uh, of infinite spontaneity and creativity, uh, a place where uh, all living beings emerge from and return to. So this is the first universe. Now the other part of that is the second universe. And Moreno describes the second universe as, as the universe of form, of time, of cultural conserves, which we'll talk about in a, in a, a little bit here. Uh, the second universe is this universe that we interface within, that we live within the universe of objects, of things, uh, the universe where we're, 
bound by time, by space, by location. And so the encounter symbol is depicting the intersection of these two universes. And at the center, it, this is where we live as human beings, or, or where we could live as human beings, with one foot in each universe. And so uh, the Marinian developmental theory, which we'll also touch upon a, a little bit later, uh, also relates to this idea. So this is a, a core aspect, uh, an important piece of Marinian philosophy to understand. Uh, Moreno believed that that psychodrama was a, a portal into this first universe where we could tap into spontaneity, into the divine. And he believed that spontaneity was, was related to God. Uh, in some of his writings, he goes as far as saying that God is spontaneity, period. That uh, psychodrama allows us to tap into this mystical energy, this surplus reality, and in doing so, leave the leave behind the chains and the ways that this second universe bounds us, confines us, and to experience something beyond reality. To uh, bring that experience back into the second universe, to have lasting change within ourself, within the group, within our relationships, and within society. So, uh, this first and second universe concept uh, you can find quite often in, in Moreno's mystical writing. Now, we touched upon spontaneity, which is uh, really also core to Moranian philosophy. Uh, Moreno's spontaneity creativity theory is psychodrama's theory of change. And so we believe as psychodramatists that spontaneity is what creates change. Not uh, new insights or changing thought patterns or behavioral modification or catharsis or free association, but spontaneity is the curative agent in psychodrama. And in psychodrama, spontaneity is defined as a, this sort of energy, unconservable energy, that allows us to have adequate responses to new situations and new novel responses to old reoccurring situations. So spontaneity in psychodrama is not so much related to impulsivity, it's more so related to uh, competence or to skillful living, having adequate and new responses in life. And so again, this is the, the curative agent in psychodrama. So uh, Moreno believed that spontaneity and creativity were twin concepts, that they went hand in hand, that spontaneity awoken creativity, that spontaneity was the energy that promoted new responses, and that creativity was what allowed us to create something new, to create a new idea to create and generate a new response and put it into action, to create a new publication, to create a new organization, to create a piece of art. So spontaneity and creativity go hand in hand. Uh, Moreno even created a map, uh, a depiction of tapping into spontaneity and creativity. And this map is called the Canon of Creativity. And when we look at the canon of creativity here, you can see spontaneity and creativity in the middle there. But the, the biggest part of the image is this circle and spiral along the outside of the canon. And so this is the warming up process. And on this other side over here, we have the cultural conserve. So the cultural conserve is a term Moreno created, and it, it means basically everything that already exists, things that were created previously that are at our disposal. So all of the ideas that have already been created, all of the music and art that's already been generated, books that have already been published, research that's already available, um, objects, everything that already exists in the second universe is part of the cultural conserve. 
And when we're warming up to new change, we start with the cultural conserves available to us as a foundation for our warming up process. So, for example, while we're uh, writing, while I'm writing uh, the book that we're talking about today, the cultural conserves that inform my warm up were all of the things that had already been written about psychodrama, everything that's already published about social work, my own experiences as a psychodramatist and as a clinical social worker, the few publications at the time that had been published about the intersection of Moreno's work and of psychodrama. These were the cultural conserves that were informing my warm-up. And as I moved through the warming-up process, at some point we tap into spontaneity, that energy that allows us to generate new, adequate responses. And that spontaneity is met with creativity, and a new idea emerges. Uh, in the example we're using here, a new book emerges. And that book becomes part of the cultural conserve going forward. So this is how we move around and through the canon as it relates to creation, really. The creation of something new. And so this canon of creativity is a map for change, for tapping into change. It's a map for, you could think of it as a clinical map for internal change or social change, interpersonal change. You could think of it of a map. You could think of it as a map for larger macro change. And I think the the key takeaway, one of the key takeaways, is the emphasis on the warming up process. That uh, Moreno writes that the spontaneity is the oper operationalization of the warming up process. That we can't tap into spontaneity or creativity without a warm up that we always, always, always need to start with a warming up process. And so I think this is uh, one of the most important things that informs my work as a psychodramatist and, and really everything I do is emphasizing the warming up process. And this is particularly true when working with trauma survivors who might need an extended warming up process as opposed to working with other clients or populations. And we can talk more about that in some of the other videos here. So um, the canon of creativity, this is a, a really core and foundational aspect of Moranian philosophy. Uh, while we're talking about spontaneity, there's a couple other nuances to Moreno's spontaneity theory that I also wanted to outline. Moreno talked about different forms of spontaneity. Uh, he described something called pathological spontaneity. And this is defined as having new responses that are inadequate to the situation at hand, whereas healthy spontaneity is new and adequate responses. So you could think of chaos or impulsivity as being related to pathological spontaneity. He also wrote about a deficiency of spontaneity. And this, this would be a a lack of that energy, that healthy spark that promotes uh, aliveness and promotes new responses and adequate responses uh, to situations at hand. I think Moreno's spontaneity theory really fits well with uh, some of the ideas from interpersonal neurobiology and from uh, Dan Siegel about conceptualizing mental health and and really social health. Uh, Siegel suggests that we could think of health, all forms of health, mental health, social health, uh, well-being, functioning, as being in the balance between two extremes. On one extreme, we have uh, chaos, and this would be pathological spontaneity in the Moranian uh, philosophy. And on the other extreme, we have rigidity or order. And this would be a deficiency of spontaneity in psychodrama philosophy. And in the middle is where we have health and healthy spontaneity. And uh, 
Some have suggested that all social issues, all issues in society, all mental health issues, emotional issues, relationship issues, all problems are characterized by too much chaos or pathological spontaneity or too much rigidity a deficiency of spontaneity. So Moranian uh, ideas really fit well and seem to be echoed throughout some of the new interpersonal neurobiology and psychology theories. Now, another important aspect related to the neurobiology research and spontaneity that seems to validate um, Moreno's suggestion a hundred years ago that spontaneity was spiritual in nature, mystic, uh, mystical. Uh, remember, Moreno said that, that God is spontaneity. Uh, he, he looked at it through an existential and mystical lens. In some of the more recent neurobiology research, they found that when they take a brain scan of someone who's having a, a religious experience or a peak experience, a spiritual experience, and look at the parts of the brain that are active and how they're activated, it looks identical to brain scans when somebody is performing a new task and facing a novel situation. And so when we remember Marina's definition of spontaneity, that it's both a mystical experience and it has to do with adequate and new responses to, to new situations, uh, we find some overlap here that some of the new neurobiology research actually supports Moreno's belief that spontaneity has a mystical and spiritual aspect to it. So an, another one of the core theories within Moranian philosophy is action theory. And Moreno really was inspired by the theater where a, a, a lot of his, um, I don't want to say bias, but a lot of his influence related to to being in action comes from. He believed that uh, all human beings were improvising actors within the play of life, on the stage of life or the world stage, and that we all were auxiliary egos for each other. We all were role players for each other on that stage. And so um, he believed that what was learned in action has to be unlearned in action. When we're wounded in action, it makes sense that the healing also has to take place in action. Uh, even the term psychodrama, it literally means soul or psyche in action. So the, the uh, experiential and action-based component of psychodrama is one of the things that really makes it stand out compared to other approaches. And particularly at the time when it was created, where really the only other psychotherapeutic approach was psychoanalysis. And psychodrama developed in direct opposition to, to a lot of core psychoanalytic ideas, one of which was the talking cure. Moreno really believed that talking was not enough and that we had to, we had to move into action, that all insight and meaning-making happens after action. That, that action precedes insight. And so uh, this is really evident if you've ever seen a psychodrama session. It's one of the most action-based and experiential therapies available. Uh, it's also the first body-oriented therapy. And uh, Moreno is quoted in saying that the body remembers what the mind forgets. Long before... Uh, Bessel van der Kolk wrote his book, The Body Keeps the Score, or other trauma uh, experts began talking about how the body and the nervous system are impacted by trauma and the presence of implicit memory. Uh, Moreno, Moreno's ideas from 50, 100 years ago are really congruent with the new neuroscience about action. And so... Uh, one of the most important findings in neuroscience research of the, the century, really, is that the brain continues to change and, can, and maintains its malleability 
its ability to adapt and physically change based on experience throughout the entire lifespan. So experience changes the brain. Not just early in one's life or, or until someone's 23 or 25 and, and their brain finishes developing, but throughout the entire lifespan. Experience changes the brain. And so this neuroscience finding really supports the use of psychodrama and other experiential therapies, uh, which are unique in their ability to provide new corrective experiences, corrective emotional experiences. There's uh, things that are possible in the psychodrama stage that would be impossible in real life. We could have a client talk to someone who died and have a new experience in relationship with that person for closure. We could have a client uh, protect themselves at the moment of a trauma or threat rather than uh, being stuck with a memory of what happened. We can change that memory and create a new memory, a new experience. We could have an experience, provide a client with an experience of nurturing themselves at the time of trauma, of fulfilling unmet developmental needs that were not met throughout their life. We could have a client in a psychodrama have an experience with someone in their life that they really crave to experience, but is unlikely to happen in reality. Uh, in psychodrama, we can travel through time. We can have conversations with different versions of ourselves, with archetypes, with spiritual figures and historical figures. Uh, there's really no limit to where we could go in a psychodrama. Uh, everything becomes possible on the psychodrama stage. So the surplus reality of psychodrama really provides endless possibilities for new experiences that change the brain. So action theory is, is again one of the core Moranian theories and part of Moranian philosophy. Another core theory in psychodrama is role theory. And so role theory is psychodrama's theory of personality. Moreno suggests that the self, the personality, is composed of all the roles that we play in our life, and that a healthy personality has a wide role repertoire. The capacity to shift between roles when needed in order for spontaneous responses. And so a a healthy personality or someone with a healthy personality doesn't get stuck in one role all the time, but has access to a variety of roles, depending on what's needed in the situation. Um, this, this phenomenon of being stuck in a role, in role theory we call this role lock. If someone is deficient in spontaneity and stuck, confined to a single role. An example of this in mental health is the role of the addict. Someone with addiction is stuck in that role. Or the role of a someone who's depressed, stuck in that role. Uh, the role of a victim is another one that we see often in trauma work. Uh, and of course, there's other roles that we can get stuck in throughout our life. Now, uh, Moreno believes that the self emerges from the roles that we play and hold in our life rather than the roles emerging from the self. And there's a lot of different nuances to role theory. just want to touch upon some of the basics in this video. Uh, the concept of the role comes from the theater. Uh, back in the Greek, the ancient Greek theater, the actors used to write the script for their character on rolls of paper and roll them up. And so this is where the term role comes from in terms of theater. Uh, Moreno really believed that role theory was unique in that it transcended some of the limits of psychoanalysis and behaviorism and provided a bridge between the social sciences and psychiatry, while demystifying and simplifying psychiatric terms and ideas so that they were easy to understand by anyone. Any of our clients that we work with can understand the concept of a role. So role theory is a non-pathologizing way of conceptualizing personality, conceptualizing 
social issues and mental health issues. And the concept of a role is one that's a, a, a cross-cultural. Cross -cultural. Um, while roles manifest differently in different cultures, this concept can be found in just about every culture and every language. So it's a, I think it's one of the reasons why psychodrama has been adapted in so many places over the world, because so many of its ideas really fit cross-culturally, and the ideas are less focused on content and more focused on process, so that they can easily be adapted into different situations. So, uh, in terms of role theory, Moreno describes three different categories of roles. The one of which being somatic roles. These are roles related to our body, to physiological experience. And these are the first roles that develop in our infancy. The role of the crawler, the role of the eater, of the drinker, the role of the crier, the role of the sleeper. These are somatic roles. The second category of roles is psychodramatic roles. And so these roles are psychological in nature, based on fantasy, based on play, imagination. These are roles related to our dreams, both our dreams while we're sleeping and our dreams in terms of visions of the future. Uh, the way that we, we imagine seeing ourselves in the future, who we would like to become. These are psychodramatic roles. The roles that we play on the stage. The roles that we play in, in games with other people. When we dress up for Halloween. When, we are, when children are role-playing. These are psychodramatic roles. And the third category of roles are social roles. And these are the roles that we hold out in the world and in relationship with others. Roles such as mother, father, sibling, friend, teacher, student, police officer, activist. These are all social roles. And you'll notice that many social roles exist within role reciprocity with another role. For example, teacher and student. They go hand in hand. They're opposite roles and they, they feed each other. They're, they exist in reciprocity with each other. Um, parent and child. These are re reciprocal roles. Now there's also what are called complementary roles. And these might be roles that complement each other. Identical roles that complement each other. Such as friend and friend. These are complementary roles. Or a partner and partner. These are complementary roles. Two peers holding the same roles. Of course, there's also roles, uh, conflictual roles, roles that conflict with each other. And these could be social roles, or they could be internal roles that conflict with each other. And uh, in psychodrama, we might be working with all different types of roles. Some psychodramas are entirely based on social roles. Some psychodramas are entirely psychodramatic and intrapsychic roles. And many psychodramas have a mix of different types of roles. Might include spiritual roles, might include internal roles, might include social roles, could include some somatic roles. While Moreno described these three categories of roles at, uh, as three distinctly different categories, of course they all overlap in many ways. Any social role includes and is related to multiple somatic roles and or psychodramatic roles. Though Moreno believed that the cluster of all of our somatic roles, the integration of all of them, uh, from it emerges our somatic self, our sense of ourself and our body. From the cluster of all of our psychodramatic roles emerges our psychological self, our psychodramatic self, our psyche. And from the cluster of all of our social roles emerges our social self. And so we have here the matrix of body, mind, and society. 
So here we can see a connection between role theory and social work philosophy in that social work really uh, prescribes or, or ascribes to a biopsychosocial spiritual approach. And we can see in Moreno's role theory um, th that there's an element of body, mind, spirit, and the social as well. Role theory and, and uh, social work really um, reflect the same ideas within each other and really complement each other and go hand in hand. They're, they're complementary roles, in a sense. So another aspect of role theory that's important is the different types or the different stages of role development. And so this is really core role theory. There's three different phases of role development. The first phase is about role taking. The second phase is role playing. And the third phase is role creating. And so these three phases describe the process that we sometimes go through, not for all roles, uh, in developing a role and in integrating a role into our, our life and into ourself. That as we're learning a new role, let's say, for example, the role of a social worker, we're first in the role training phase. We're learning what is the role of a social worker? What does it look like? How does it fit? How, how do I fit within that role? How can I learn behaviors associated with that role? Who are the role models that I can look to that are modeling this role to me? And exploring some of my resistance to the role. So this is all in the role taking phase. We're learning how to take on a new role. Now at some point in our development, we start to get the hang of this new role. We start to get a good sense of what the role entails, skills and behaviors, competencies related to the role. And we're able to begin playing that role, taking on that role, and doing it with some spontaneity, doing it in a good enough way. And we move into the second phase of role playing. And this is where we can, we can adequately play the role. In this case, uh, we can play the role of a social worker. Uh, you could think of the social work internship process as a role-taking uh, process. And that when one successfully graduates and completes their internships, gets their license, they're now in a role-playing phase in terms of the role of social worker. They can hold that role out in the world. That role has been integrated within their self, within their psyche. Now that third phase of role development is called role creating. And this is a phase that we don't actually get to in every single role in our life. Though for some roles, we move beyond just playing the role as it was taught to us and as it exists as a cultural conserve. And we move beyond that. We bring all of our spontaneity and creativity into that role. We bring ourselves into the role. And in doing so, we create a new way of being a social worker, a new way of holding that role, whatever it is. And this is um, described as role creating. Now, oftentimes when we get to this role creating phase where we've created a new way of holding the role, it brings us back to role taking in that we've created something new and now we're in the process of, of uh, learning how to take on this new role that we've created, or the role transformation that has occurred. So these are the three phases of uh, Moreno's and Psychodrama's role theory. Role taking, role playing, and role creating. And of course, there's many other aspects of role theory that, that we're not going to get into uh, here. There's other phenomenon related to role theory, such as role expectation, which is the way we expect a role to feel and be before we take it on. Uh, in the example of a social work student, the way we imagine being a social worker would be. This is a role expectation. Then uh, another role phenomenon is called role demand. This is a, a, something that we use even as a clinical intervention in psychodrama directing. 
where we place an expectation onto somebody else to take on a role and to play it in a certain way. We put a role demand onto a supervisee to step up into the role of social worker more fully, to further integrate that role within themselves and to not be afraid to, to fully be a social worker in the world when the time is right. This would be a role demand. Now, another role phenomenon is called role fatigue. And maybe this is uh, in the social worker example, someone who's overworked, who's working too many hours, who isn't the best with boundaries, who's underpaid and has to work more hours. You're just exhausted of being in that role all the time. So role fatigue described as the fatigue, the exhaustion that comes with being stuck in a role. Now, when we're finally able to de-roll from that role, we would experience what's called role relief. And this is another role phenomenon. The relief that comes from being able to de-roll, to step out of a role, to no longer be expected or demanded to hold that role. Now, another different type of role phenomenon is called role self-congruence. And this is looking at, is a specific role Again, for example, the role of social worker. Is this role congruent with my sense of self and my other roles, the collection of my other roles? Does this role fit with who I am as a person, with my personality? Or is it not congruent with who I am as a personality? And I'm sure um, our career choices are largely impacted by our sense of role self congruence. Is the role of social worker one that fits with who I am? Is the, you know, in terms of other career choices, is being a police officer congruent with my sense of self? Is being an activist congruent with my sense of self? Is being a doctor congruent with myself? Is being a father? Is being a therapist? Um, there's countless examples of of roles that we could consider as it relates to role self-congruence. So uh, there's a lot more we could say about role theory, but these are the basics of role theory. And so previously I had mentioned Morena's developmental theory. So I want to uh, introduce some of the basics of Morena's developmental theory uh, now. Uh, there's three phases in Moreno's developmental theory. Uh, and these three phases mirror the interventions that we use within a psychodrama session. First phase is doubling, the second phase, phase is the mirror, and the third phase is role reversal. So the double, the mirror, and the role reversal. So these are the three phases related to child development in Moreno's perspective. Now the first phase doubling. This is when a, um, actually I'm going to start even a little bit earlier than that. If you remember earlier in the video or in a previous video, we talked about the first universe and the second universe. And so Moreno believed that when a child is born, that they're emerging from the first universe into the second universe of forms. And that they're in this state of oneness with all things. Moreno called it the matrix of identity. That they don't experience themselves as separate from their mother, from their caregivers, or from anyone or anything. They're still, um, they're still integrated with the first universe and kind of plunged into the second universe. And so the first phase of child development is doubling. And this is where the caregivers are, are helping the child consciously and unconsciously. I think a lot of it happens instinctually. Helping the child to label their experience. Helping a child who's, who doesn't have language yet, doesn't, can't articulate what they're experiencing, what they want, what they feel, their sensations. So the caregivers are doubling them and helping them to do that for them. And in doing so, helping them stabilize within the second universe, helping them to accurately label their experience, 
helping them to begin to establish a sense of self through doubling. The second phase of Moranian uh, developmental theory is the mirror, mirroring. And this is the stage of development where the child begins to uh, develop a sense of self to the point where they can see themselves in a mirror and recognize themselves. Uh, they start to uh, differentiate from from their parents and from others, no longer in this matrix of identity. And so what we often see, especially in trauma work, is clients who've experienced developmental trauma, childhood trauma, abandonment, neglect, complex trauma. These are uh, often examples of inaccurate doubling and mirroring from caregivers, or simply a lack of, or an absence of doubles and mirrors. And so without adequate doubling and mirroring in the early stages of one's life, instead of developing a healthy sense, sense of individualism, a healthy sense of self, the ability to label and articulate one's experience, internal experience, to understand one's feelings and, and cravings and desires and sensations, there's a misattunement to self that emerges from a misattunement from the caregivers. And so um, this is often what we're, we're encountering, what trauma survivors are experiencing. And so we might think of as psychodramatists how we can uh, cl be clinically informed by the developmental theory as it relates to the types of trauma, abandonment, and neglect our protagonists or clients have experienced. When we're working with a client who never received adequate doubling from their caregivers growing up, we might intentionally create opportunities for more doubling throughout the group. And this might be really corrective and reparative for the client. It may help them further establish a sense of self, help them be attuned to what they want, what they feel, what they experience. The doubling might be really corrective in that way. And in the same way, mirroring could be really helpful. In the psychodrama process, the mirror intervention is when we ask the client to step out of the scene, someone else steps in the scene for them, and then replays that scene so they, the client can see it from a distance, almost like they're looking at a mirror of themselves in action. So this uh, mirror intervention can be really useful when a client is really stuck, struggling with self-awareness, or just oblivious to how their actions, their behavior is experienced by others. Or it can be helpful for integrating positive change, helping them to see it from the third hand perspective, third person, rather than being in the middle of it in the first person. Uh, so doubling and mirroring are the first two phases. And, and doubling, there's different types of doubling, which we're not gonna get into all of that in this video. Um, the, the role of the double the way it was originally developed and the way that both Zerka and JL Moreno primarily used it was that the double was a role that stayed with the protagonist throughout the entire psychodrama. And so the double was attuned to the protagonist, helping to verbally articulate things that may be unspoken for the protagonist in the moment. If the protagonist relates to whatever the double says, they would repeat it in their own words. And if whatever the double says doesn't fit for them, they would just change it to correct it. And so it's really an opportunity to uh, get clear about what one's experience is or to, to speak one's truth. Now in more modern psychodrama practice, while some practitioners do use the type of, of doubling that the Morenos used. Psychodrama seems to primary psychodramatists seem to primarily use um, what we'll call hit and run doubling, where the director or an auxiliary role or an audience member 
will come and offer just one sentence of doubling for the protagonist and then go sit down rather than the double being a stable, consistent role throughout the entire process. Now, the therapeutic spiral model of psychodrama um, has, um, in some ways, adapted the original way, the original role of the double into what they call the containing double or the body double, specifically for trauma survivors, helping to balance expression with containment, which are important clinical functions for healing trauma in a safe way or helping to ground a protagonist within their body. So there's lots of different types of doubles. And so the third phase of Moreno's developmental theory is the phase of the role reversal. And developmentally speaking, this is when the child progresses to being able to not only have their own sense of self their own identity separate from others, but to see and realize and understand that everybody else is their own person as well, with their own feelings, their own perspectives, their own, uh, their own self, their own experience. And so in the role reversal phase, the child can then imagine what somebody else might be experiencing. Uh, of course, in psychodrama, Uh, practice in terms of psychodrama intervention, the role reversal intervention is when we ask a client to switch roles with another role in the scene and become that person, become that element, become that role, and to see themselves from that role and speak to themselves from that role. So these are the three phases in Moreno's developmental theory. Um, There's an article where Zerka expands on these three phases, integrating them with Erickson's psychosocial stages, looking beyond just child development, where I believe she creates uh, eight stages throughout the entire lifespan, exploring both doubling, mirroring, role reversal in childhood, but also throughout the lifespan, and in particular in relationship to one's caregivers. How developmentally as the parent and caregiver's age, the the adult child often becomes a double, a mirror, and is role reversing for their aging parent. As the as the parent prepares for their transition out of this universe, and in Moranian philosophy back to the first universe. And so it's a, a, a full circle in the way Zerka outlines it. And you can find this short article in the book, The Quintessential Zirkle. I'm sorry, The Quintessential Zerka. So there, there's a, a lot more that we could say about Moreno's developmental theory. And uh, these three phases are used um, within a specific psychodrama intervention a process called the social microscope which is one of the core interventions of society. And perhaps we'll we'll cover that in another video. Um, But this is the foundation of Moreno's developmental theory. And so you can see many of the connections based on what's been outlined thus far between social work philosophy and Moranian philosophy that both really emphasize the importance of social justice both really emphasize and elevate the dignity and worth of each individual. Both really emphasize relationships and the person within their environment. I mean, Moreno's sociometric system is all about the person within their social environment, about how social forces have impacts upon individuals, about how uh, both are, I mean, psychodrama and social work are both systems that have a micro, meso, and macro practice to them. Uh, working with individuals, working in groups, and working with within all of society, within communities. Uh, the six core values of the social work field 
really are congruent with Moranian philosophy. These six core values are social justice, service, integrity, competence, the importance of relationships, and emphasizing the dignity and worth of each person. And so uh, I think my the video so far in my presentation of Moranian philosophy, some of the sociometric concepts and psychodrama ideas really illuminates how these social work core values fit within Moranian philosophy. Um, I, I think some of the ones that we haven't fully touched upon would be service, integrity, and competence. Whereas the core values of social justice, the importance of relationships and dignity and worth of each person are really, there's countless examples of how these are embodied within psychodrama practice and Moranian philosophy. Um, in terms of competence, I think when we consider the definition of spontaneity as, as being related to competent living, we can see one connection between Moranian philosophy and social work philosophy. I think too, the, the, when you look at the um, training standards for becoming a psychodramatist and just how it takes 780 training hours to get certified as a practitioner of psychodrama, uh, it becomes really evident how how much the social work community really values competence as a core value, just like the social work community does. Now, uh, one of the other core values in social work in NASW is service. And so uh, this is also echoed throughout Moreno's life and Moranian philosophy. Uh, in Moreno's autobiography, he writes that the world at large needed a doctor more urgently than the sickest individual. He says, I began to think in earnest that I had a special mission, that there was an important service to be rendered to the world, and that there was no reason why I shouldn't undertake that mission. And here we can see Moreno really elevating the value of service to the world, service to humanity, service to others as core to his mission as the founder of psychodrama and as the first psychodramatist. Uh, Moreno uh, really challenges us to be world therapists, to work on a larger scale rather than just with individuals or small groups. And so the, the other core value we haven't touched upon from NASW is integrity. And I like to think of integrity as saying what I do and doing what I say. It's about being congruent with myself and how I act. And so, um, of course, like any other professional community, the psychodrama community has had their own issues with unethical practice and pathological spontaneity in Moreno's terms. But integrity is really uh, valued. And the role of psychodramatist is one where the human being who's playing the role of psychodramatist is expected to, to really bring their full self into the role. As psychodramatists, um, we really value the relationship between professional and the group. And psychodramatists are encouraged more so than other professionals to be in integrity with, with who they are to be transparent about who they are, about their experience in the here and now. Psychodramatists tend to use more personal disclosure than other therapists might. Uh, there's a, a um, there's a way that this core value of an integrity really is the glue that holds together all of the other core values. Uh, integrity is about wholeness. And there's different layers of integrity. There's a moral integrity, a professional integrity, personal integrity, intellectual integrity. And again, there's a way that the psychodrama training process really emphasizes integrity in that in order to become a psychodramatist, not only do you do 780 training hours amongst other requirements, but in those training hours, 
we learn psychodrama by doing it. Every psychodramatist, before they're certified, has been the protagonist of their own psychodramas countless times. That we do our own personal work throughout the training process. That we're encouraged and tasked with addressing our own core issues so that we can be more in, in integrity throughout our careers. That our, we're less susceptible, hopefully, <laughs> less susceptible to countertransference and the uh, issues of our past impacting our present work. That there's a, an emphasis on integrity in that. Uh, Moreno really believed that psychodrama was not just a profession or a psychotherapy, uh, but a way of life. And he really encouraged and promoted a sort of integrity between one's personal and professional self. And so we can see that the six core values of NS NASW and the social work profession are echoed throughout all of Moranian philosophy, psychodrama practice, sociometry practice, and Moreno's vision of society. So if you found this video, I encourage you to check out some of the other videos on my YouTube channel here. I hope that you did find it helpful. Feel free to uh, reach out to me if you have further questions. Um, there's a lot more content about um, all of these ideas within chapter four of my book, Social Work, Sociometry, and Psychodrama. Uh, feel free to uh, subscribe if you want to be updated about uh, future videos. Subscribe to the channel here or to leave a comment below uh, about what you found helpful or what you'd like to learn more about for future videos. Uh, we really take some of your comments and feedback into consideration when thinking about uh, future videos that we create.